I was thinking the last time we were in this room uh, in uh, November for Neil Werner's talk, um, you'll recall that it got darker and darker, and we never did find those light switches over there. And I remember um, Neil at the end of his talk was sort of cowering against the afterglow from his PowerPoint, so the professor could. But we're much better illuminated today. Uh, I'm Doug Pesci, I direct the writing program, but uh, thanks all for coming out on a cloudy Friday afternoon for uh, this conversation with Michael Berube. Uh, I'll explain the format in a little bit but as you, uh, and we're not sure. We don't have like a table or a dais that we're sitting up in, so we, we might pop up and down and see how this works. Um, by way of introduction, and I, I put these things on the, your chairs so that I could um, spare you my recounting a very long and very impressive uh, list of publications and accomplishments. But I do have a few things to say. On January 8th this year, Michael Berube posted his last installment of a blog um, that he had been running steadily since 2004, um, garnering several hundred thousand hits a month. Uh, won many awards. Um, the blog is a mixture of uh, autobiography, theory, social commentary, news bureau, all sorts of things. Uh, the telling links that run across the top are home, essays, family fix, and hockey. Uh, the depth or the depravity of that last link is sort of signaled by the fact that Michael plays on two teams in the Nittany Hockey League. Um, he explained in various fashions his, his decision to discontinue the blog, but I thought I would read one chunk of this because it's salient to our conversation today. He says, blog maintenance on this scale is a daily, sometimes hourly thing, regardless of whether there's a new post up. And even if I didn't try to maintain the blog on this scale, a good idea in itself, he's responding to to please, Michael, please keep blogging, but just do it shorter. You have more time and energy. Um, even if I didn't try to maintain the blog on this scale, there's still the problem of invisible blogging. I don't write these posts out in advance, you know. I sit down for an hour or two, more for the really long posts, write them in one take and word perfect, look them over, transfer them to the blog, preview, edit, submit, and then proofread one last time once they're up. Because sometimes you can't catch a typo until it's really up there on the blog, and even then I've missed a bunch so far. Which means, among other things, that I do a great deal of the planning before the writing while I'm not blogging. And that's what's been so mentally exhausting. It's like ABC from Glengarry Glen Ross, always be composing. Uh, I'll not elaborate, as I said, the verbal tonnage that's outlined in the handout um, that I placed on chairs. But when, what you can imagine is that uh, Michael Grube is always composing in some fashion. What we'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about um, that composing process, uh, about that writer's life. Um, as you can see, and for those of you who know his work, um, he's been a tr tremendously influential commentator, both within the profession of English studies, uh, the profession of uh, academic work in general, and various matters in uh, uh, political and otherwise in our culture today. But uh, we'd like to focus on, on uh, his work as a writer. So our format here will be fairly informal. I've got a couple of co-interlocutors, uh, John Tiedemann and Kelly Custer, uh, both from the writing program. Uh, we've prepared a few questions um, to, uh, to pitch to him, but then I'm going to turn over to you all and see what questions you might have. Um, and we'll see how this goes after 45 minutes or so and uh, um, where the conversation takes us. I thought, though, um, I, I might invite, and actually, like I said, he's got um, a current piece of writing that uh, might be interesting for this occasion. Uh, something coming out in the Toronto Globe and Mail, and I'll maybe invite you to characterize that and whatever else you want us to know. Well, thanks. And um, I don't think I'm going to be able to resist the temptation I mentioned to you earlier 
to Levi James, the team, presentation, <laughs> 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 I can't keep that up. Um, the essay itself, and I just want oh, well, to get back to this whole thing composing thing. It's very interesting you read that. Um, sorry, I forgot it. Um, because it is true. I mean, even when one's not writing for the blog, one is always composing. Uh, if one is uh, in line of work, you're in. Uh, um, either you're thinking of your essay, or you're thinking of something for class, or you're thinking uh, of something about uh, grading papers, what have you. So there really is no downtime, uh, except sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I've had a number of teaching anxiety dreams in the last week, so I've had my work. One of which I have. It was 11 o'clock class that I was supposed to be teaching, I've never been to. So the opposite of the <laughs> dream where you're a student. Um, it was a class on disco, but I wasn't teaching anybody. <laughs> um, okay, actually, two writing. The, the essay in question uh, is an essay on prenatal screening, which is a complicated enough subject as it is, but I want to say a few things about uh, writing for the public, what uh, that means first, because I don't expect to hear too much of this in this room, but you can hear some places in other rooms sort of disdain for public writing because it's not professional, it is not a specialized audience, it doesn't advance research, uh, and it, it goes to the uh, and, and, you know, it, it also, the arguments I heard early on in my career is that it inevitably involves dumbing things down, using shorter words, and it, it, people think it's all about it being on TV. Uh, so far, I am innocent of TV. Uh, all of my so-called public intellectual work consists of writing for magazines and newspapers. Two things about that. One, the standards are not lower. Uh, on editing and composition uh, matters, the standards are a good deal higher. Uh, you may be edited for how style of that academic kind of journal, but you are not going to have your paragraphs messed with. You are not going to have your syntax improved. Uh, it is going to be assumed that you know what you're doing. And I think a lot of the things about academic writing have to do with that more than <laughs> jargon. Quite seriously. Um, second, what about jargon? Jargon is not the problem. Everybody has a jargon. I only get the whole question of jargon. The question, I think, about academic accessibility, and especially in the humanities, was really or should have always been a question of where people are writing and for whom. And there are different audiences for whom different knowledges are expected and, and uh, assumed. And we can get away with saying uh, hybridity in some fields, and everyone knows that it refers to post colonial debates about this, that, or the other. But in the field of, if, for example, in the, the essay I've, I've just written, which now exists somewhere in cyberspace and will appear in print on, I think on Sunday. Um, I had to get up to speed on what the uh, story was of creative screening and Down syndrome in Canada. Everyone who reads this thing is going to be aware of that. It's a different kind of specialized knowledge. Okay, the essay yes, itself. <coughs> two things about the composer. Uh, I think in terms of mm, two things. One, um, it's almost always in terms of argument. Most of what I do in, in Nonfiction. <clears throat> so, right. well, most of what I do is, uh, it, it, even this, this is called a think piece, and therefore it doesn't have to be uh, directly argumentative, it still has an implicit argument, and those I find at this point in my career are uh, relatively easy to compose. It's a question of when you're going to actually stop. So, 800 words, as you spend it off it, it's excruciatingly difficult to say anything, any complex, people can do it on marvels. They gave me 2,000 words because it's a fake piece. So it can be thoughtful and it can raise things that it really you know, doesn't necessarily have to answer for the end of the piece. Now, <clears throat> the second one space limitations. That's the one that you don't have in academic journals, so you can run on for 40 pages. But in newspapers, um, the word count usually actually matters. So they gave me 2,000 words for this, uh, this article. Back with 2400. I used my standard excuse one, some of them are small words, <laughs> two, some of them are not mine, and shouldn't be counted against me. <laughs> um, and I also have a, a cast of cold eye on the discourse of space limitations sometimes because I got this actually from the Chicago Tribune. One only time I've been in their book review pages. I reviewed a new novel, and again, maybe 900 words, I came in at 975. You can see I come up, go about 8% over whatever. <laughs> And again, I said, uh, I, mean, I actually, actually have to give a flavor of some of the novels of prose, so they cut 40 words. 
And on the back, on page two, where I have a little column run on from page one, the largest crossword puzzle you've ever seen. Do with your elbow. So who knows how the layout works? But you have to deal with these things in media that you don't really have to deal with in academic journals. Sometimes they're quite real, sometimes they're just completely fascinating. The argument itself is that um, they expected, I think, that a parent a child with Down syndrome, like me, they would be against prenatal screening across the board because they considered, as George Will put it in his Newsweek column about a month ago, a search and destroy. Um, now, it's true that 80 to 90 percent of the people who screen for Down syndrome are global. And so everyone who's against abortion is against that. But it's more complicated than that. Some people are against abortion make exceptions. Some people in favor of abortion don't like screening for reasons with disabilities. Then you have to start getting into the conversation about what disabilities we're talking about. Uh, because Tay Sachs disease, which involves a child who's born, developed normally for six months, then these little fatty deposits grow in the brain, and eventually the child can either read, uh, see, speak, hear, breathe, becomes paralyzed, dies, and excruciatingly painful death around the age of three or five. It is almost as if, I say this in the essay, it is almost as if this thing was invented by bioethics. Extreme case. Who in their world, who in their right mind, is against screening for case acts? It confuses every political position you think you know. The people who are most aggressive about it in New York, for example, are the hospital. The ultra orthodox Jews, because it, there's a big higher incidence of uh, uh, case acts among national procedures. So they, this is a group that does arranged marriages and create a screen. So let's say that first, you know, because even though I would, uh, I would rather people not. Hearing the things of Down syndrome, that's my preference. I would rather that be a matter of persuasion rather than state coercion. So that's my you know, pro choice, skeptically pro natal screening, and yet I would rather that people not try to eradicate trisomy 21 from the human population because I don't think it's that bad. And you know, my 15 year old, who uh, has now learned a little bit of rudimentary French, knows more about sharks than anyone here, unless there's a marine biologist. <laughs> Uh, knows all the state capital rules, you knows uh, basically things I've never imagined a capable of. If I had known that in 1991 when we refused amniocentesis, on the grounds that we didn't want to take the chance of a miscarriage, wanted to it, compared to the chance of having a child down syndrome at age 36, which one of mine was, wanted to it. If I had known that, I would have made the same decision when I wanted to have Okay, last thing. What does prenatal screen not pick up? Autism. Cerebral palsy. Schizophrenia. For basal developmental delay. Even if you're in screening and you didn't think that people should have access to the information they think they want, it doesn't tell them all the information they think they should have. Human life is just more complex. So I've got all that to 2000. <laughs> <laughs> Not just now. <laughs> <laughs> and then the edit came back. Um, and I'm pleased to say, first of all, there's, there's another thing about, about this kind of writing. I have a, a former struggling musician uh, anxiety about these things. Uh, very unique term. You always want to be invited back. No matter how bad, bad the thing is, <laughs> it's better that you turn them down. So you want to be a cliche. You want to not provide a great deal of work for the people at the other end of this uh, exchange. And you want to at least turn the first draft that will look more or less like the genre they're expecting. The hardest one I've had to deal with in this uh, respect is uh, Times Magazine second page. The first page is the you know, sort of, you know, and the second one is the way we live now. Their demand is that I be topical, counterintuitive, and not authentic. I have no idea <laughs> what that means. <laughs> it means you really can't argue a point, you just raise something and sort of, you know, and, and it's, it's extremely, extremely difficult to do it. I've only done three of them, and uh, I missed on two others. Yesterday morning, before playing hockey with Dean Seda, uh, uh, at uh, whatever it was, 9.15, I told uh, Trevor Wilden that we have to have us back from the 10 their time. That's the other thing about work. We have really deadlines. Academics have deadlines for four months late, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but this is much more like being a student again, because the anxiety dreams, it really does have to be in by 8 a.m. And I wound up uh, calling it instead of writing back, because I really had to argue for one second. Cut a sentence about how some people with disabilities <clears throat> are easier to accommodate, according to the standard of reasonable accommodation, than your average 
selfish, impetuous, normal person. However, there is a uh, However, at the same time, uh, it's a question of how they'll be accommodated. Some people have health issues. Different story in Canada, we don't have to be employed at healthcare. And of course, in the US, uh, the unemployment rate of people with disabilities is somewhere in 70 so a lot of them are on supplemental security income, and that's not incidental. So I had this line about some of them are easier to accommodate than your average selfish person, although there's a question of how their health care work, and if indeed they get work at all. That sentence got cut, because it you have to restore that because uh, the question of how people will be accommodated socially is also a question about the work. And that sets up the point at the end of the essay, which we're going to write down. Excuse me. But the paradox of multiple screening is that we put a regular time of resources into protecting people with disabilities in utero and not enough time to become an expert. So I made my case, but of course I have now bargained for 70 more words and had to like propose 70 be cut. And, uh, so I like, cut uh, 50 of George Whittles because they're not mine. <laughs> I cut a whole paragraph, I proposed, you know, if you need the space, if your crossword puzzle is not too large, here's two or three, uh, and I ordered the paragraphs. Here's the ones you can cut if you need, uh, but I really need that sentence restored. And uh, there's one sentence, turn things over. There's something about how, um, right, uh, biomedicine, for, for, right, I mean, for good reasons, considers prevention better than symptomatic treatment. Right? Uh, and especially, that's one of the parallels of US healthcare. Because people don't have it, they wind up in the ER with more severe things instead of getting uh, uh, either early treatment or uh, cure. Better prevention. If you apply that logic to pregnancy, right, <laughs> that's one of the things about putting on better, better way to prevent <laughs> Down syndrome than we have. But, and, and, and so the sentence was something like um, biomedicine rightly believes that uh, uh, prevention is better than symptomatic care, and uh, match this logic uh, inappropriately on the pregnancy and child. And I said, no, we can't do that. It has to be applied. And we went back and forth on this. Mm -hmm. said, no, I'm sorry, I just didn't do the pivot right. And then meanwhile, they had broken up on the front of my paragraph into things that made more coherent sense in the newspapers. And we talked about the paragraph transitions and how they did. This is more rigorous editing than I've gotten. And I mean, this is not the state of this newspaper. This kind of more rigorous editing than anything I've gotten since I was in college when I started writing this. And that's, that's what I mentioned. Talk, that's what if anyone has to ask about that essay or this kind of process. It took me, last point, a decade of teaching to realize that I was reading the students' papers as it was better as a result of having that kind of feedback on the other. But here's a case where like, uh, writing that wasn't even tied to research, wasn't tied to my, uh, um, you know, that end of my, my CV, was making me a better instructor, a better teacher of writing as a result. Um, and partly because he's writing four different audiences in different genres, on all different occasions, that I was able to bring that to bear on uh, students. Do you take any of that uh, when you're doing your academic articles? Do, do you find, as, a, as an academic writer, uh, putting something in an essay review or something like that, that you, you edit or think differently? Or are these such different processes that you kind of click on your public discourse, these conventions, here's academic and, and academic? Navigate and separate those. Um, I still. Not only do I, I uh, write more colloquially uh, than, than most people do, even for writing publications, but yeah, I do, I do actually take those lessons as a character. It's one of the reasons um, the editor of one journal asked me to contribute this special issue, and I said, sorry, I can't, can't do it all the time. And they said, uh, it'll be great to have you, you're a clean editor. Mm -hmm. Ah. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's how my booking agent is. Um, <laughs> Again, the main difference is a leave an essay, for example, uh, and, uh, a sort of full dress analysis of uh, Colson Whitehead's novel, The uh, Intuitionist, that came out in this collection about two years ago. Uh, again, it's a, it's a question of, of what background information the white people should have. Uh, to mention that this thing is a sort of postmodern noir novel in the mode of the low Austrian pension, that's been the first like, page. 
and uh, there's also a sort of uh, story of creating migration through the as a candidate, which is for Jackson and Griffin, who's a performer. So it's, it's fairly a densible paragraph. I assume academic audience is at least familiar with these points of reference. Um, but there's no real difference in terms of uh, composition strategy or, or uh, anything else. I guess it's just a good question of which, uh, which audience is out there reading that. I don't know what to do. If I have a, it's kind of an occasional question that this needs to be Right in the context. As you know, the Catholic guy that's been a little bit of a philosopher, Arthur Schlesinger, passed away. And as I was reading through the various tributes and the Coney Dove song that have come out in the newspapers in the last couple of days, I was struck again by what a really remarkable persona Schlesinger created for himself mm -hmm. as a writer, as a, a public intellectual. And, I think what I found most remarkable about it is that on the one hand, it was so very constant, but so very diverse. It was to say that he um, was sort of advocating the same political agenda for the 60 years of his publishing and wore the same bow tie and <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the same time. Time. The same exact time. Yeah. But, but he also, with that that persona, proved to be remarkably adaptable in any one of a number of different contexts, from, from academic publishing to political periodicals to movie reviews and articles for TV Guide and so on. And that, that sort of unity and diversity in his, in his uh, persona seems to be consistent with this politics as well. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if somebody who publishes likewise with a lot of different genres, a lot of different contexts, if you might talk a little bit about the nature of the persona that you've created for yourself and how that mm -hmm. plays into your, your writing in these different contexts. Mm -hmm. words, do you see it as a Constant that remains across different contexts and there's different masks and occasions and so on. Right, masks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a basic question. Um, yeah, first, I mean, I read a couple of things on, uh, on blogs. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Schmidt had just written in an essay, I think, for the American Prospect Online, a sort of Ubisunt moment where all the Schlesinger's of today, where are John Kenneth Galbraith's, and uh, Atrios responded. He still did, I think, an economist uh, himself, and he says uh, a lot of things in academia prevent you from even attempting to model the kind of policy person. Now, I want to put myself in, in, in the Sussinger's uh, tier, first of all, in terms of uh, 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 renown and accomplishment, but also in terms of he got a lot closer to state power than I am. I mean, you sort of read a reported story in the uh, years. Um, there's that, and there's the fact that he was held down the Bible for uh, 450 years. And that kind of, um, to go for the chief easy point first, that's our gender position. Uh, very few women uh, find a popular in that kind of uh, position in public, in public uh, discourse. And whether or not it's, uh, it's attainable across the board, that's the chief easy point, is uh, it's up for grabs. Or whether, this was kind of the debate about, uh, I'm going to take everybody back. Remember the 80s? Uh, where you know, we, to, we were told by this uh, Foucault guy that we no more general intellectual, just specific intellectual, uh, he was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, or to be more responsible and historicize it, yet one more French intellectual to do that song. As he boomed over French intellectual life, and you know, the sort of guy who would speak to do anything. And I think that sort of, um, uh, that sort of persona is, uh, is actually still available in some, in some context. Um, uh, uh, the obvious example of mine, Max Ricardo, uh, is uh, Paul Krugman, uh, holding down a bit now, I believe, the, the left wing of the New York Times, where once he was with the other world's leaders. Okay, as for my persona, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the place where I got the, the widest uh, rating, of course, was the blog, uh, where you know, not, not only did I post uh, pictures of the hockey team, but actually write out how of course, most really never contacted me, <laughs> despite my demonstrated expertise <laughs> as, a, as a sports commentator. And um, there are other things on the, on the blog that are updates about Jamie's life, or just you know, occasional observations, things that I couldn't sell any place else. Uh, but so, but by the way, the things that I couldn't sell any place else were usually 1,500 to 2,000 word essays that were occasional essays, one, for example, about the movie. And I just felt like you know, doing it for the day, but no one was really interested in it, so I'm on the blog. 
the blonde will project it. But this sort of um, uh, 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 quirky, not entirely uh, serious, sometimes downright, you know, uh, uh, Simpson's quality, silly persona. You can all be indulged with a blog, but you couldn't always get away with any specific things. Uh, if you want to know that Times Magazine or And that was, uh, that, that, was the, that was the thinnest part of, uh, of having a blog. Was, to indulge in various prose identities, none of which really are masked. They are like, they're, they're different uh, 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 approaches. And all. The other thing, of course, was the hyper. Okay, once I found it was more easy and fun to have the hyper. <laughs> right? Because you can pose an entirely facetious thing and make it a link to something that actually gave you the serious version, right? Or they kind of make you outright and gave people the, oh, it is a parody. Right? <laughs> uh, the first couple of parodic things I did on the web, you know, very hard to tell parody on the web. Uh, I did uh, the Republican National on a day. I don't know if I have any people who read the blog back in 2004. But the uh, former student of mine, that teacher George Washington, insisted to me that I had to watch the Republican National Convention and block it. I said, God, I don't make that much work. All right. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And uh, I decided to do it. I'm going to do the full. Uh, I'm going to do it hardcore. I'm going to watch it on Fox. <laughs> And so the first night, I pretended to fall for it. I was like, hey, these guys aren't so bad. Hey, Koch, be good at Now, I, I come from New York, okay? I remember, I, never mind Koch, the bad man, who's like the uncle who comes down from the attic ranking to the dinner guests. That Koch, I knew the Koch who ran against Westway, a $2 billion highway boomed up on the west side. He took his hand off the light on immigration. Oh, Westway's okay. I mean, I've never seen a guy turn vote fast like that in 15 seconds. I like that. This guy was a creep even before he went. Uh, they put full blown PPs going now. And then, of course, Giuliani gets up. So, anyway, I posted this whole thing about, hey, what is this pretty easy? And it uh, got picked up by Atrios. I was in 10,000 years in a day denouncing it as the most horn swaggled academic they've ever seen. <laughs> so, I got the next day, let's see whose horn is being swaggled. Now, now, now we got Schwarzenegger, and so forth. And I decided to write the whole thing out until um, the RNC itself. I was so impressed with my blogging. This is not true. Um, they invited me to my own skybox for the third and fourth nights. Blogging <laughs> from the box until I, until I decided in the middle of Bush's speech that it wasn't, it wasn't fire and brimstone enough. He was talking about my kids will learn algebra and we will have home loans at 2% less. And, and I wanted I want to sell Miller back. He <laughs> threw me out of the box, even though in my box I was uh, being. Uh, Congratulated by Rich Carver, the National Review, they had in front of me $8 million I was saying from Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> in a glowing, uh, you know, Pulp Fiction reference. So, anyway, long answer, I got to build a whole range of you know, political satire, uh, um, broad comedy, what have you, that I very rarely get no, no chance to do in academic journals. So one time, I snuck in a completely gratuitous joke. Um, it was in social text. It was about the Yale graduate school. <coughs> and I said, you know, it was astonishing to have Yale faculty uh, were opposing to the students because their response was, these are not exploiting the workers, they're exploiting the workers. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if you think back you know, to the early 80s with the, with, the, with the Yale school, these people felt they were the criticism. They were the future of criticism. And every other day, I've seen other things, my criticism, I said, those were those were days. You know, those Jake Hillis, Paul, Jeff, and Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> then came the rumors that Paul was dead. <laughs> they let that stand. It's the only time I've tried to do that. And it, it, it served no purpose at all. Uh, but then I said, you know, it was an idea to be back in those days because sure things that people had to say, well, and now all of a sudden they're realizing we need a PhD, we need to get jobs, we need convention experience for the faculty. But yeah, that's the only thing we try to cross genres of the Otherwise, I think it's basically it's different, uh, different versions of the same kind of person. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I'm interested. You actually brought this up earlier about um, something that was published in Teaching Six. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. You said that um, that your well, in the, in the article it says that your research does not necessarily enter the classroom, nor should it. Mm -hmm. However, your writing certainly does because of the way you respond to your student texts, which I found quite interesting. 
And you went on a little bit later and, and really championed the concrete people, um, you know, saying we should all be paid five thousand dollars a class regardless of at least. Yes. <laughs> no, that was that was that was exactly regardless. And yet you ended that paragraph saying, but I would still be told. Yeah. Tell me why. Um I like that. That's really the, the context of that was I've been embroiled um, for a couple of years in a lot of needless squabbles with uh, people in my comp over a sentence I thought they were badly misreading from the of English, in which I said the really you know English departments waffle all the time about why they exist. Um, the best version was something I wish I had. Uh, <clears throat> I wish I had said that, and so you will. Uh, it was actually Jerry Heron in his book, uh, his 1988 book about the university. And the title of the line was that basically English departments uh, tell people that they can, uh, that their demystifying operations will help them see through corporate capitalism as they train them for jobs like, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, the fact that this kind of logic is reversible, I said, well, you know, there's no specific logic for teaching literature. And English departments will often on that too. Uh, sometimes they speak of the cultural heritage or complex text. There's no specific rationale for literature. We've been writing the backs of composition for about 100 years on this, and people teach composition now. And we're also writing on them for, uh, for enrollments. Uh, financially, it was part of driven by enrollments. If you look at it from that perspective, it doesn't matter whether you have an old school lover of Keats or a uh, funny glasses wearing queer theorist. Uh, they're all like, paid for by warm bodies brought into the department. Warm bodies. Oh man, it took me three years to live down the warm bodies. Because, <laughs> because people were suggesting that all I thought of Red Con was that it would process for warm bodies. And no, no, no. I didn't mean all short people should be. I mean, no one. I said, no, no. I mean, that, 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 that way you look from the budget perspective. You put on the budget goggles, it's just, hmm. Oh, infrared, warm bodies, and <laughs> not too many people in heats. <laughs> that's, that's what I meant. But the whole passage to say, look, that it's an incredibly important course pedagogically, uh, you know, not only financially, but also in terms of the international student writing. Um, and the fact that uh, we have to apologize, either in that or in literature, for doing uh, this useless research. Well, no, all of us must. We're working in media that I don't know about. I always do something off with writing. It takes a form of writing. And it's a completely different kind of debate from you know, the question of whether physics research you know, it has an effect on the undergraduate work. So we should say that. Uh, at the end of the day, though, I still think, I mean, because I uh, uh, trained in literature, and I thought this was a needless debate anyway. I mean, the, 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 it happens that um, people who, in, in Redcon, I was thinking about a collection I just read, actually. They asked me to write an introduction to it, but I said, no, I can't do it. it was too, this is a collection, the entire collection is, if only we can break down the elite, you know, urban drinkers in the skybox and we're teaching literature. <laughs> uh, no, we're not, we're, we're paid about the same as the sculptors over in the fine arts book. <laughs> the elite there in the logo. Um, <laughs> and I thought this was sort of too much of an interesting uh, struggle. I'd like to say, my, my, my initial um, uh, love of field and my training was all in the teaching of literature. I preferred to do that uh, in the teaching of writing. But not against the teaching of writing, since I like it. So the thing that also the fact that um, the last thing is um, how many, the other question that I asked was how many faculty teaching faculty courses. As far as I'm concerned, we should teach everyone in America. Again, it's the same sort of thing. Many audiences are people who have never heard of the academy. Therefore, are not uh, are not to uh, uh, don't feel one way or the other about being smashed um, or short of it doesn't really matter to me. Most of my total level students, and then this semester an honor seminar, next time there's something else seminar. Sometimes, uh, uh, well, I still haven't done a uh, you know, three hundred room, two hundred person lecture. I'd love to just do it. Yeah, you know, really but that's what I've got. Sure. Um, I'm curious then that you say your writing helps you to be able to respond to students' writing, but do you use your experience as a writer in class to talk with the students about their writing 
So not just on the, on the reply, but... No, 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 they're all they're just on paragraph conditions and why they never I mean, it's standard complicated stuff. That's it. In fact, uh, I got into it on um, an extended conversation with many of the articles about why this paragraph must be understood as a pivot paragraph from the uh, previous paragraph, and it's not. Uh, it's lost. And why, one reason to look at, okay, if you... If, you open a paragraph with this, I will kick your paper. <laughs> what, what's the antecedent of this? I don't know, that's <laughs> the previous whatever I said. And it's just a little more of a, uh, this followed by a passive verb. Um, uh, so uh, I did a whole, I usually do a whole thing just on how paragraph functions matter. What kind of expectations you should have set up by the end of, say, one quarter of your essay? Why it makes sense not to repeat your premise? Why are it useful to have the good paragraphs that are studying them? Let me ask if, if people here have questions. I mean, we, we're, we're well armed and have lots of things in our pockets, but. Uh, <laughs> um, Um, as a fledgling, uh, you know, newly minted PhD, who's also a mother and teacher. Um, how do you find time to be such a prolific mother? I was just wondering. I didn't lose it. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, <laughs> seriously. That's why I couldn't any longer devote uh, three hours a day to the book. Um, I was hoping that one of the things would free me to do one of these think pieces because I don't want to give up. You know, these other kinds of uh, uh, thank you. But um, for one thing, no teaching work helps. That's, you know, but, but at the same time, all the invisible service work. One of the things that uh, I, when I get back in group blog, I want to ask a really academic blog is one of the reasons, I wonder what, why so few senior academics have a blog. It's not only because blogs are the things that these kids today have, but it's also if you're still a member of the profession in a responsible way, if you've got all manner of committees and service, that actually sort of, sort of accumulating so heavily. In the fall, but I found I couldn't make time for, for writing it and making all of this. But like I said, no teaching really helps. Uh, as for how to um, uh, do it on a daily basis, I had my first job when I was 24. Um, and I actually don't know anymore what to do if I have eight hours after that stretch. Because, quite seriously, I, I learned to work in very short, intense bursts and then leave sort of mental post it notes, get it back to, that's the only the proposing part. Um, if I can't finish this today, I'm going to find, by the way, just a piece of advice. Uh, stopping point is usually not going to stop. Stopping point in the middle of something, that's going to stop. If you need to spend the rest of the day, I'm going to start to get it back to I, I found a lot of stuff. If I stop something full, you know, at the end of a full mental prep, very hard to stop. It's hard to think, you know, stop in the middle of a sentence, then, so I learned the, um, by necessity how to work in a one or two hour person. No, like, He's asleep. Um, <laughs> Apple Valley and juice. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, then there was a whole stretch of that. I mean, after after two years, it was quite serious. I didn't have any interview in the house for about eight months. Fortunately, the way academic publications work, nobody noticed. <laughs> <laughs> There's still some things coming out with you. Know, but with the blog was very different because, of course, the team goes up that way. And you just, like, once you put the, uh, have the reader expectation that something will be there you know, four or five times a week, you know, for two weeks, you get an email, and you're there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was a different order of um, uh, obligation altogether. And we began to feel like an obligation and a pleasure, which it did around uh, September, which was mm -hmm. last year. I, I knew my days were going to But otherwise, uh, I had found because I was a relatively young parent in the middle of graduate school, I was the only way I was going to get out of school. I was about working in short and intense bursts. I sleep as much as I can more than anybody else uh, by the time. I just, there too, I prefer if I were left entirely to my own devices, I was going to two to seven, and then nine to ten. Um, and there too, I learned to work around where the So, I, I, like I said, I had a month of fellowship. It was the first time in my life, a uh, residential fellowship in the National Humanities Center in March. 
and for the first two weeks, the four week thing, I did not know what to do with 16 hour a day. I was like, no, I didn't have a budget for anything like that. I wasted so much time. And it was great. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I find you know, working, you know, but also uh, another piece of that, working to false deadlines, not really, you, you pretend they are anyway, that that's, that's, you know, everything. X has to be done by 11 tonight. And it's not that it has to be done by you know, six the next day. So, no, it's certainly not a dissipation. I've been a little bit about your process of revision. Let me pop that for a second. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, writing the public context and use articles, uh, timings, and things like that, versus uh, writing for academic journals versus writing a blog. I'm a little curious to write about uh, hearing a little bit more about what motivates you to revise and mm -hmm. say you get a peer review from an academic journal. Journal versus reviews from the blog. Uh, part of the reason I'm smiling, no, it's a great question. But the last two peer reviews I got uh, were for people who were very confused. <laughs> <laughs> um, one was a, a, a collection that was um, the Emily the approaches to teaching <laughs> series, and it was Emily approaches to teaching like books. And I was assigned the rather strange. Uh, the, uh, do an essay about teaching white noise alongside underwood. And so you have to white noise, and also you have a 30 page um, epic novel. And uh, only 12 pages. That, that I could have done for 60 pages. Don't get me started about underworld. You don't have enough you know, uh, uh, recording uh, material for that. And I just talked to again two weeks ago, so it's all fresh in the memory. But, so I wrote this very, very brief essay about the relation of, uh, of motive to narrative. Uh, what happens in, in, in motive to plot? I think in the end, white noise is plotless and deliberately so. And it talks about its plotlessness as it goes in sort of a uh, standard meta way. And I got back a research work that said, oh, this is, you know, this is well written. <laughs> it's a clean edit. Um, but it's not clear to me why they decided to write about Underworld. And <laughs> if you could just take out the Underworld sections, so sometimes I, uh, this, I won't even go into the other, uh, talk about it briefly. Um, I, was part of, I was part of a consortium of seven essays, seven short essays put together. They sent it out to a reader who thought it was all the work of one person. <laughs> I kept that. That's in the miscellaneous file. I can't believe this. <laughs> this person says they teach this, 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 and this. This is taking I literally to an extreme. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes peer reviews just worthless. Um, but no, what makes me, uh, can I answer your question more specific? What motivates me to review the word on that scale is usually enormous chunks of revision. Entire argument has to go has to be formulated. Uh, entire paragraphs have to be ripped apart, the sinews have to be messed with, and, and uh, sometimes I want to just you know, scrap in the thing and do it from scratch. I've never done that because the blog is, uh, I mean, my, my post, at the last post, uh, slightly acknowledged. Once I went over the thousand word barrier on blog posts, which is you know, like war and peace for blogs, yeah. uh, there was no stopping me, and some, some things went on you know, 3,000, 4,000 words, and I found people still reading them. It was drug like. <laughs> <laughs> detox. Um, <laughs> but the only thing that uh, uh, induced me to revive my process of revision for things of that scale are usually much more technical. They really are much more precise in about the paragraph transition. About, so, oh, I've had the number of um, uh, oh, misphrasings that I wish I had back. Uh, those are usually fairly minute. I've never gone into something like that and said, this whole argument. This whole tag, whatever, that, that historicization is wrong. I'm going to have to address this. I actually, the first thing, uh, first academic I said I had published, was the second thing that came out of it, um, I got to produce reports back, and I took the last section, which was two pages long, and rewrote it from scratch, and hoped that if they didn't mind, they would get a you know, five page. Uh, and I don't think there's ever any reason to do that kind of we can maybe have one more question. I'm, I'm curious to hear more about how um, initially you got started in writing for more public audiences and, and, what, and how you, an academic, go about, say, marketing oneself in a certain way or, 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 or helping those possible audiences or how you, you, know, you break into that in a way that um, is both rewarding and, and also. Feasible. Yeah. Um, actually, I can do my notebooks impersonation now. 
It's sort of a version of the same answers to Europe. You know the 2000 year old band sketch? Now, why do you have music? Why do we have music? Fear! We have fear! That's why we have music. Uh, so basically, uh, what would have been fear. Uh, the first test I did was, was about PC. And uh, since 1991, I kept waiting for some you know, distinguished liberal academic to respond to this to Susan and Kimball onslaught. And you know, so Catherine Stinson stepped up to the plate, oh, straight down the tree. Stanley <laughs> <laughs> Fish sent back to the dugout. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know, what the hell? I, you know, the second year assistant professor, I had no idea what I was doing. And um, I, I, I shopped it around uh, Harp. Harper's at first gave me the, uh, they now told me Michael Dukakis response. This will quote Kara, this will be quote. She said, betcha well, betcha well. And sure enough, it didn't, and they kind of say, by the way, or not. Uh, actually, I, I, I admire you know, uh, of all the people who might possibly be uh, suspicious as a key big person of national except he had a major trial, right? And actually, was practically not there at that time. So but these are the number of things I, I, I wish I had. But no, I originally sent it out because I thought there was going to be no response at all. Got a rejection from Harper's, and just so happened that year. At Illinois, it was this woman, Lisa Dugan, who is now at uh, NYU, uh, queer historian, uh, author of Sapphic Slashers, and it was a galvanizing presence on the campus. She took one of them and said, You know, send us to, uh, you should send us to Stacey Direction, who was a literary supplement, and see what they said. And I said, Sure, I'll send it off, and they called me up a week later and said, uh, this looks great. Uh, this is uh, very timely. I was waiting for the admission in Virginia. So they took it. And then I had a running gig with them for about three or four years. And no, really no place else. It was just voice that are a supplement. And I was such a newbie, uh, I didn't know what things not to do. So I actually, I started by a couple of audition mistakes. One of which was kind of really consequential. Uh, in that first essay, if I can ask you to do with Manan, I pointed out that Manan had filleted Roger Kimball's book in the pages of the New York Republic. Voice calls me up and says, Manan has just given a positive review to D'Souza's book in the New York. You may not want to cite him here. And I said, oh, really? That sounds weird. And of course, in those days, this was 1991. They didn't have any of this. So I didn't see them. I was in Illinois. New York was going to arrive for like another month. You know, for a wagon train. They were even mistaken or lying. Uh, Manan did the same fillet on, on D'Souza in New York, or they done on, on Kimball in the New Republic. And so I took it up uh, at their suggestion. And uh, then Paul Bergman called me up some months later. He wanted to apologize. And he said, yeah, I have one question about this. No, two questions. That's great. One, um, I think Roger Kimball made that video. I didn't mention this. I guess the fact that it was the video was going to happen. Uh, and two, he says, um, you have a line here about how when he was in Dartmouth, Nestor Souza published the stolen correspondence of members of the gay student alliance at Dartmouth. As soon as he is contesting that claim, I'm going to ask you to start. And I said, it's true, I have the documentation in front of me. I actually have it on facts. It was sent to me by Dartmouth. Urban over here. So I thought, geez, if I'm in the anthology, I'm not in the anthology, and I read that to both English and Greek. Person I am now, I'm just you know, the hell with you all. Uh, keep in keep in the man, keep in the uh, keep in the Susan. So I mentioned all of that, that second half, in the uh, uh, preface of the introduction of the public access, where I spoke about again, sometimes sometimes when you negotiate with editors about these things, you lose. And sometimes you <laughs> if you were me and you were 29 years old, you gave up before you when you should have. You saw that in public access. You made me have to be the bad guy here. If that's the way you felt about the D'Souza reference. You should have kept it in. You should have pulled the essay. And besides, you plagiarized Kimball's book. Back to him. I said, I did not plagiarize. And I was pointing you know, perfectly well what the story about that was. And next time, as far as D'Souza's concerned, if he says it's nice outside, I say it's raining, just eat the damn umbrella and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I've been worn out on the D'Souza trustworthy uh, meter ever since. But yeah, those, those were my first two interactions. Um, and then from that point on, it really wasn't a question of marketing myself. Or, uh, I, I, didn't, I, I had an agent uh, for book life, as we know it, but I had no idea 
how to pitch a book proposal to a trade press. It's a completely different genre. It's a 30 page of their best It's like doing screenplay or something. Uh, you went an abstract for having an academic press. So it's a little bit of a 2,500 words max. <coughs> it's like a long abstract. Uh, for a trade press, they actually want like an excerpt or a sample or something. And uh, so I needed some help. I did a great deal. But uh, since then, it's really after that, just a question of um, building relationships with individual editors. And then getting passed on with one of the most stranger things uh, was I got one of these turned down from Times Magazine. Uh, but the editor who commissioned it, the editor asked me to do it, liked it. It was just killed by higher powers. So he gave my game to Golf Magazine. So I was also in there by everybody, but I wrote two names for Golf Magazine. Uh, sort of as a consolation for us for being rejected from the Times Magazine. And there, again, it's a question of um, either be, A, being a clean edit, and B, uh, being able to turn around the provision. Other than that, it's just the same as any other sports like that. They don't give you an My first entree into the door was, was by my first entree. This is a great storytelling, but, but in fairness to Michael, who uh, DU has made work very hard for a couple of days. This is work. <laughs> uh, and, and I want to, the, several of you know Dean Sater, he's sitting back there, but, but uh, Michael's here under the offices of the uh, Faculty Senate, the Honors Program, uh, Center for, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, Community Engagement, approximately, and the, and the Writing Program. Uh, it's, it's been a delightful conversation over uh, a couple of days. Uh, and I invite you to stick around and have a few refreshments here. Uh, Michael needs to get spirited up, up to Boulder in uh, uh, 20 minutes or so. So he'll be around for a while. Please come up and say hello. And thanks for coming. <laughs>